All right, what's up, everybody? You're listening to the Iskandi Sports Podcast, the number one podcast, basketball podcast, being recorded in my house right now. I'm, I'm very confident in that one. I don't I'm, think I have any competitors. Mine too. Yeah. Mine too. <laughs> uh, my guest today is head coach of Oakville Prep Basketball yes, sir. and trainer Dustin McTaggart. Dustin, what's up, man? Nothing, man. I'm so glad you have me on. Thanks so much, dude. Hey, not a problem. The guest list isn't that heavy right now, so <laughs> we're all good. Stepping stone. Um, so um, as a prep school head coach, how did that come about? And why did you end up choosing Oakville? Yeah, man. Um, it's kind of a, it's a long story, but it's a pretty cool one. Um, I was out of the basketball scene after my college career. I was out West and um, ended up coming home to some, because of some family circumstances. Um, and basketball was always something I was like, I was in love with has been like my thing for as long as I can remember. And I came home and I wanted to get involved. And my little brother was actually playing Monarchs basketball. It's a rep team in Mississauga. And there was an opportunity to coach there with my, my old man, actually, my dad was coaching him. So I jumped in as an, uh, as an assistant coach and then really liked it. Like, it's so much fun working with these kids, are like 14 at the time. It wasn't even the top team, it was the B team, but it was something I enjoyed. So I actually reached out to Oakville last year and said, hey man, can I just like get in there and be a part-time assistant coach? Like, can I come and help? Mm -hmm. And the head coach at the time was a good friend of mine now, Jamal McQueen, uh, gave me a call. We kind of knew each other through basketball from before, but he said, yeah, come on out. So my, my role was 5 a.m., morning practices at LA fitness. And that was it. Um, I had a full-time job at the, at the time that wasn't basketball. It was an IT market, but Jamal said, yeah, come on in the mornings. And then my, my flexibility was, okay, I can do after schools too sometimes. So I did both of those. And then Mel just said, Hey man, can you just be our lead assistant coach who Mel's our owner? Um, so he said, yeah, so I did that, fell in love with it. Then the year after I interviewed with the OSBA team as a head coach, um, and one of the U sports teams. And then I got a call from Melvin asking if I would do the head coaching role at Oakville. So things kind of fell in line and where I'm at now, like I couldn't be happier. So, yeah, it's a really quick timeline. Things seem to happen pretty fast for you. Um, is it kind of coincidence or, how happy are you that you are staying in Oakville kind of where you did the basketball circuit yourself yeah. and now giving back to it? How did that happen? You know what? Like it's a blessing um, just by knowing the talent and knowing the guys that I grew up with who are around that can come and help out and making it feel more like a, a community thing as well. But honestly, like with what Melvin has set up for this program to move forward, like he knows that this is a stepping stone for me. He knows that I want to be a high school coach forever. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's helping me grow. He's helping me network as well as the guy from the MPA. So like that alongside the basketball setup that they have, which I think is like one of the best in the country from a schedule mm -hmm. standpoint, from like a living accommodation standpoint, from what he's able to pay me as a coach was never like, this was never available. Mm -hmm. So that, but plus being 10 minutes from Burlington where I grew up is phenomenal. I still get to see my family. I still get to see my friends. Like, it's awesome. So being a Burlington kid, how, how have you seen Halton basketball, we'll say? How have you seen that scene grow? One, from playing, and now two, from watching from just outside of coaching? Like, I didn't realize that I sat down, and I actually sat down with the owner of the MPA. Uh, mm -hmm. His name's Tarek Sabi. I probably butchered that, so he's probably getting <laughs> his, name, his name's Tark. And he we sat down and we're just like, let's talk about Halton basketball. Mm -hmm. And the amount of pros that come from this area and the amount of guys who play high level basketball overseas or play division one right now or play division one or played high level U sports, like who are stud basketball players, there's so many. I didn't even realize when you're playing, like these guys are gonna be as good as they are. Mm -hmm. Like, it's phenomenal just seeing guys that I grew up with on my rep team and where they played. It's just like those, that list of guys just goes on and on. And seeing as like a 16-year-old kid at LA Fitness, 
and the basketball being good and then going back there three or four years later and those kids now were those kids in high school or mm -hmm. oh where's that kid oh he's playing at wherever division one down south or whatever it is it's crazy to me how good halton is like if you think about like that orchard area like oh, yeah. Apple, the amount of pros that are in there like that are buddies, <laughs> that, like next door neighbors is hilarious they have their own network the, the families little they get together they talk about what the next move is going to be what school is your kid going to what, what's the coach saying over there like they train yeah. together um yeah it's For sure it's, it's there's that one block and i think like fiondu simi like all those guys live right yeah. next to them. they're all nba players yeah man and low-key hot take i think this next wave coming up not as good athletically but more skilled than i'd say at least our age bracket growing up we had a lot of great athletes but yeah. i'm sitting in the gym i'm watching 13 year olds consistently hit like nba range threes i it's ridiculous like you're <laughs> right i work with a 13 year old and a 10 year old right yeah i work with them pretty consistently training and the 10 year old the first off the 13 year olds like ambidextrous left hand right hand whatever but mm -hmm. the 10 year old as well can ball handle better than like half my prep kids and he's 10. <laughs> so i i think it's it's so good that i think some kids are growing up with a basketball in their hand instead of a hockey stick or maybe even both because like the skill part of it it'll get you far enough like steph curry showed you that like there's smaller guards in high levels of plays now if you can if you can hoop man you can make it so it's gonna be wild we had a good good gen come up i think the next gen is gonna be pretty crazy Dude, so you're talking like, about, yeah go ahead sorry no you go it's all you go ahead i was just gonna say like even like the emergence and popularity of basketball as a whole like yeah that we have all these teams and there's the prep circuit and there's all this stuff we never had before but there's outlets to better training like when we played or when i played and my little brother played who's 25 now like you went to your rep practice and you went to your school practices and that's really all you had. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how many individual workouts I did my whole life. Like, I think I did like five within college with a special, like with a guy and one in high school, with my high school coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, the, even like the rep programs here, you like, I'd say some, some of the house league guys, they're getting training on their own. For sure. It, it's, it's gotten, it's gotten serious. It is. And I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about training. Cause you, you're in that space as well. Um, just at a personal level, yeah, man. What, what, a, what distinctions do you have internally about coaching and training? Because I, I've done both as well. I kind of gravitate towards training more. I like being kind of hands-on. But from your perspective, what, what do you enjoy more? Um, you know what? I think it's kind of like a – it's tough because the way that I look at it is when I'm training – whether it's a guy who played pro or guy who plays pro guy who plays college, high school or middle school, whatever it is, it's always positive. Mm -hmm. Like it's a little bit more laid back. We're working hard. We're enjoying the working hard. You mess up here. It's all right. Like, let's just mm -hmm. get better. Let's work on our weaknesses and let's grind it out. And then when you get onto the sidelines, it's like you get that feeling of like looking down at another team and being like, I want to beat these guys. Like, I want to beat up on these guys. Like, let's win by 30. Let's, like, leave this game happy. But that comes with the stress of every practice when something isn't working out. It's like, now it's me, too. So now I'm pissed off all the time. I'm swearing at these kids. I'm yelling. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's so much different. But I think that they go hand in hand in the sense that if you're not making your – players better basketball players as a head coach then what are you really doing like yeah you can teach them how to defend a pick and roll better or you can go over different reads and different scenarios all the time but if you're not building their skills then how are they really going to be better and I think Kyle Julius is a guy in a name who's been around since I was playing who is a head coach but focused so much on player development that it kind of it mixes so yeah you can do something like that at some point yeah, you're talking about the frustrating parts about coaching. I don't think you've lived until you've yelled at a 14-year-old <laughs> on a basketball court. It's the most, it, it feels good coming out, but then you just realize I yelled at a, a teenager yeah, for, missing, for missing a layup that I probably wouldn't have hit at 14 either. 
for sure. But <laughs> Why didn't you make that read? He's like, what read? You're, like, uh, you're right. You're right. You're yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm just playing basketball coach. It's my third game <laughs> ever. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you're right. Like for sure. The, I can't describe, like if we lose, I'm like in my room watching the film, like <laughs> swearing, throwing stuff around. Um, how have you guys been doing with the lockdown at Oakville Prep? What are you guys doing to stay sharp? So it, it like it's a lockdown, right? Like right. we don't have any access to anything. Um, but before that, we were going twice a day right up until Christmas break. So it's not good. But when we go twice a day plus extra training on the side that we do at the house, like your body gets beat up. Right. So having a little break is, is all right. Mm -hmm. Um, Lockdown's tough. And to be honest, I've been, I told my guys what I expected and we have a really good relationship as a team. Like people feel comfortable talking about whatever it is Mm -hmm. and people feel, feel comfortable expressing how they're feeling. So I told these guys, I'm like, hey, this is what I expect from you guys. Let's stay in shape. Let's get stronger. Come back a better ball handler. Lie in your room. Shoot your shots up in the air like we used to do when we were like seven. Right. Um, but just, just stay into basketball. Watch it. And then when we come back, everyone will be on the same page and we'll just be ready to rock. Yeah, I didn't mean to trap you when I said lockdown. I meant pandemic. I yeah, 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 Dustin's not breaking any laws. Dustin's yeah. not breaking any laws. I'm, I'm confident yeah, in that. I am good. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, you, you mentioned the house. How did that come about? The Oakville Prep House. Yeah, so we're I'm in it right now. Um, mm-hmm. Melvin has done such a great job with our amenities are phenomenal. We live in a three million dollar mm-hmm. home in Oakville. Jesus, <laughs> like it doesn't get much better than that. It's not like one of these prep stores you hear kids sleeping in closets or whatever the heck they're doing. Mm-hmm. Like we live in a phenomenal house. Like I've never been. None of my friends had houses like this growing up. So the house is amenity wise is phenomenal. The setup for the boys is great. Um, we are a team upstairs. Like that's where we stay. So we got the 10 boys in their room split up with bunk beds. And mm-hmm. then actually my bed, my bedroom's like the one, I guess the East wing of the West wing of the house. So I have enough space for me to get away from these kids, mm-hmm. but it's like the East wing like, of the $3 million house where we play. <laughs> You thought That's your awesome. was bad at your house with like three people on it. Now yeah. there's people on it. <laughs> like you can't load shit on your phone. Yeah. Um, there's been. I opened it up to Instagram, and there was one question about like health and nutrition and training. Are you guys doing anything like that right now in the house? Like, what, what really can you do under the circumstances? You know what? It's tough. The boys aren't here. The boys are at home. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think that we're, since we're a, a, a business or whatever it is, a program, that right. we have to be locked down too. Right. Makes sense. Um, but throughout the year, like, again, it sounds so, it sounds better. Like, once you hear it, it's so good. Like, we're catered three mm-hmm. meals a day. Mm-hmm. So someone comes and drops off three individual meal plates for each of us, um, which are usually pretty healthy. Like, there's a lot of carbs in it, but the kids are burning so much. Like, they burn right. so many calories that it needs to be like that. Um, we do our little workouts in the house. The kids have little workout regimens that they can do if they want to. Um, but to be honest, we're still trying to find like that missing piece of mm-hmm. let's have a professional strength and conditioning guy or a nutritionist to really break this down because I'm a basketball coach. I graduated mm-hmm. from business. Like I don't have that background and I'm not going to try to wear that many hats as a prep school coach and be telling these guys what they need to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's probably a balance there, right? Of like, yeah, this is a prep school and this is a basketball program where we're going to take it more seriously probably than a high school or any other level that you're playing at right now. But like, they're still they're still young, right? You can't really, yeah, I think if you push too hard, you're probably going to drive some kids away. For sure. And you can see it right away. Right. Like the first couple, the first week or two, you're like, this kid is built for this. He's going to be special. He's going to do this. And they're like, these kids love basketball, but though, like, Maybe not. So I've already had two or three kids uh, leave this year. And mm-hmm. none of it has been like, oh, you said this, this, and this. It was like, I just don't think that this level is going to, like, this isn't me. That's, and it's a valuable lesson right now. It, like, if, if you're going prep, you're probably thinking about going D1 or like a high level college and then yeah. probably pro, where it's, it's the same stuff. So if you can't, 
if you can't really cope with it now, it's going to be really tough later on as well. Exactly. Like our So our schedule, myself and Melvin try to make it so close or as close to the next level as we can. So these kids are, I think our youngest is 15, grade 10. We got 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds mm-hmm. in a house. They wake up every morning at 430. They practice from five to six thirty, five to six, six fifteen, six thirty. Then we're back. Then they're in school till usually a full year. They're in school till two thirty. Mm-hmm. Then we're in practice from three thirty to five. Then the kids come home, shower, eat, and then we I make them do a mandatory hour study hall, right. which they can just brush up on all their homework. If they don't have homework, they got to do something. Like it's not time to sit down here and go on your Instagram and look at your TikTok mm-hmm. for an hour. Like these kids got to like buckle down and then go to bed and do it all over again. So it's so much that you have to be a hundred percent into this. It's starting to transition into a job, which is presumably what these kids want. For sure. And I have a kid on my team who put it best this year. Like we did a training camp. We're running like crazy. I felt so bad for these kids. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) we used to do this when we were a kid. (laughs) I would have quit my ass right away. Yeah. But I have a kid on my team who's been doing prep since grade nine. Uh, his name is Ron Agrewal. Phenomenal kid. Good kid. Yeah, you know him, right? You're at one I, I, I am. Yeah. yeah, great kid. And these kids are like, one of the kids is like complaining about the training camp. And he's like, dude, business trip, not a field trip. So now that's my thing. I'm like, dude, this is a business trip. It's not Trademark fun. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Shout out to Ron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good, good quote. It's ours now. Um, <laughs> um, have did you guys have the house when there were still games and stuff? Like, when, did you guys have any like tune-up games and still live in the house? How, how old is the house? <laughs> so last year they were in a different house, okay, uh, a couple blocks the other way, but same amenities. Like, right, they're still in ridiculous homes. So this house is one that we moved into this year, right? Um, but, but living in a house isn't new for these guys right now. Not well. Some of them, depending on what program they were at. One of the kids that Royal Crown last year, I think they're out of like a hotel all year. Right. Oh um, but a lot of these kids have experienced it. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard. <laughs> this, like, it's so hard this year because of, all right, now our morning practices are canceled. We got to find a new gym or all this mm-hmm. stuff. Like, this isn't like a frat house. Like you still have to, right. to, you still have to do your shit. You're here to play basketball. Don't be staying up until 4 a.m. wrestling yeah <laughs> yeah uh, jake jake on the last one was talking about how uh there was a certain prep school where like they took your phones at eight o'clock like there's yeah. no <laughs> i take my phones yeah we take them at the, and i don't even have to take them like that was a rule it was established right away 10 yeah. o'clock your phones are in so they come down here they drop their phones in the bucket and they mm-hmm. come down and get them in the morning jeez man well it's they part are, of the they, job <laughs> it is part of the job they argue it like coach what am i supposed to do at go to sleep, like put your phone in and go to sleep. And then by the third day, they don't even complain. Yeah. It's just yeah. like one of those rules. So what's it like going back to a house with 10 guys after a loss? Has that happened yet? Yeah, it's, it's tough. And then you, you'll notice all the different personalities. Mm-hmm. Like some kids will just like right after it's, it's over. We lost whatever. Right. Um, it's tough. And like, they're young, like they're young adults. Mm -hmm. They have to figure out how they're going to handle it. And then they see me who I just, I don't even talk that car. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Don't even look at me. But you know what? It's not that much different after a win either, to be honest, because there's always things to do better. I I wonder what's more healthy for them at this age to be frustrated at the loss or to be able to cope with it, put it away and keep going. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think it's important to understand that we lost. Mm-hmm. And I think it's understand it's good to understand that we don't play this game to lose. Right. But what did we do? Like why did we lose this game? Were they better than us? Probably mm-hmm. not. We're pretty talented. Mm-hmm. Did like what is it's our transition defense. I'm gonna go out there and say it. We yeah. can't play <laughs> D this year. For some reason we can't play D. Yeah, it's but there's also the other side of the, the the coin too, where you have a lot of kids that like they don't they don't get frustrated like at all, and the loss happens, it happens, whatever. They're back on their phone, they're they're on Instagram, whatever. They're chilling, and it's just like 
I, I almost think you kind of need to have some sort of like internal low key internal rage to, to, to have that fire to keep going. Cause you can't just be okay for sure. with losing. For sure. And especially I didn't realize it until I started doing more and more recruitment for players. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these coaches want to see guys who want to win. Mm -hmm. So you, we don't play this game to go out there and try to score 20. Like, that's not why we play this game. We play to win. Mm -hmm. So if you could tell right away that a kid is all right with losing, then do you want that kid on your team? Exactly. You mentioned recruiting and that was the, the hot button topic on my Instagram yeah. When I tried being really mysterious too when I announced on Instagram I was having a prep coach. Being like, yeah, I prep coach on the podcast this week. What do you guys want me to ask? And like immediately everyone's like, it's Dustin, right? <laughs> <laughs> Your videos on my Instagram, bro. Um, I, yeah, you know what? I, we didn't do a good job hiding it. Um, no. it it's Dustin. <laughs> and, uh, anyways, but a, a lot of people had questions about recruitment, right? They want to know, um, like, what are the things that we can do to like, get recruited what could you do for me blah 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 blah. but before we even get into that yeah. on your side how much of recruitment are players reaching out and how much are you proactively finding them if that makes sense like being recruited into a prep program right yeah you know what it happens a lot mm -hmm. like i don't know how many requests i have on my instagram from kids who are looking to play basketball at this level Right. Like it's, it's unbelievable. And you should see the ones that come internationally. Like I'll get messages from kids in the UK. I'll get so many messages from kids in Africa, in right. Asia. Like it's crazy. Um, I try not too much not to focus on next year while we still have so much work to do this year, right. uh, but always like the same thing. Like just be ready to play. Like know what's, what your role is. Not every single player. I think Matt Delvadova said it. Mm -hmm. Matt? one of those guys was like not every single company is looking for a ceo some of them need that guy to come in and clean the halls or whatever it is so as long as you know what your role is and you can play your role at a high mm -hmm. level there's probably a spot for you on one of the 50 prep teams there is now in canada but coach i want to go to the nba i want to average 25 like how do you get guys to buy into a role at a prep school level you know what that is the hardest thing at any level from guys who say it in NBA interviews is how do you create the buy-in? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the way that we created buy-in this year, now my guys are bought in, like no questions asked, my guys are bought in. The buy-in this year was we, when I stepped into this role, we had a four-star ESPN recruit or ESPN rank kid mm -hmm. uh, who I was getting calls from Kentucky for. Wow. I had a shooting guard who was the second in the NPA last year in scoring. Mm -hmm. Small forward, 6'5", kid from South Carolina, stud. Right. State power forward, two-time state quad A state champion of Ohio, and then a seven-footer with like six Division one offers. Right. And then I recruited all these guys to be like, hey, let's come in and learn from these guys. Let's, let's back mm -hmm. these guys up. Let's go in and as the most talented team, what I thought was in the country, let's mm -hmm. go kill everybody and get better and – have like a crazy year where we're going undefeated mm -hmm. and then the border closes and the border doesn't open so now we're sending these players to different prep schools because we don't want to watch there and sit then what let them run and not play right so my buy-in was now we went from being one of the best teams in the league mm -hmm. to on paper not very good okay so our training camp is going to be super hard mm -hmm. And it's going to be long. It's going to be two weeks of just grinding, no basketball. We didn't even dribble. Like, we are going to run. We are going to do workouts. And from that moment where I told all these young kids who I recruited as second string guys or third or like no minute guys, now this is your team. Now you're my starting point guard. Right. Now you're going to have to play 20 minutes this game and we got to win with you. Right. So the buy ins there. Mm -hmm. And it's been special this year just seeing these kids like, really mesh together and, and like play it's it's a um there's a payoff right to maybe taking a better a better offer with a better school basketball school and maybe getting less playing time or maybe a role you didn't seek out um 
for a lot of reasons, right? One being, you never know what happens, like in your case where you got, you have guys that probably thought they're going to be maybe bench players or role players getting legit minutes, which is great. Yeah. Another one is just kind of like a gravity, right? So how many times have you played, um, you know, a game against a team that you know you're outmatched against and play up to their level, right? You elevate your game because you're playing people that are better than you. So that also has the same effect in practice and just like in the house, probably just taking the gravity. Exactly. And then you feed off it because you do see it Mm -hmm. and you have got in the, the reality of prep school basketball is you guys are all playing to win games together, but you're all fighting for the same scholarships. Like there's a ton out there, but listen, you're a point guard and you're a point guard. You're the same age. You're fighting for scholarships, right? But you guys are teammates and your friends. So how are we going to make our practices where you guys are competing as hard as you can go at each Mm -hmm. other so that when someone goes at your guy on the court at that level, you're comfortable with it. And then you're stepping in the back that guy up as well. Right. How much do you think the house, I keep coming back to the house because it still blows my mind, but how much do you think the house helps with that? Where, you know, you're competing with these guys, but it has to, you have to leave it at the door at some point, right? Like you're spending so much time with them. The, and that's a thing. Like you, you'll see it. Like kids will be, well, first off, the kids gravitate to each other. Right. And certain kids gravitate to different kids, which is super cool. Mm-hmm. But I would say the house helps so much in the fact that we practice twice a day, but then you're in the house. So you're not seeing that as the second shooting guard who is going to take your scholarship or a kid that is fighting for the same scholarship. It's now you're like one of your best friends. Mm -hmm. So you live with your best friends and then now you bring that to practice where you compete like that. Like that Mm -hmm. creates like a, a bond and a friendship and a, like they're the best teammates because of that. And going back to the Jake pot earlier too, um, those connections you make along the way with guys that you know really well, they come back in handy uh, later on. So Jake was saying like, I think how is his uh, spot right now in Spain has in part to do with just guys he met along like the journey, right? Guys will put in a good word for you, you know, five, 10 years down the road. So it helps. Um, So grade eight, nine, 10 kids looking to play prep, what are maybe like three things they could focus on to, I guess, better their resume to, to play at a prep level and get into a prep school? For sure. I would say the, the biggest one is no, it, it's your caliber. Like, no, it's your caliber. Mm-hmm. If you are a guy who doesn't start on their high school team. Let's try to make a, a guideline where it's like, hey, man, like, we're not good enough to play yet. Right. Like, you need to get better to play at this level. A second thing is, like I said before, just know your role. Like, know what spot you can, like, know what you play and how you play and then find a team that needs that. Mm-hmm. And third, just be like, be ready for the speed. Right. The speed is so much different than high school basketball. It's insane. Like you see these kids, I think LBA last year, the team out in London, beat a JUCO team or a D2 school. I forget what, they, what, the, what, what team it was. And that is college level basketball being losing to high school kids. Mm-hmm. So it's not a walk in the park. The lifestyle is not a walk in the park. It's, it's a grind and it's hard. Definitely. For, um, I was going to say, uh, with right. the, with the, um, with the kids you have now yeah, and the kids that you coach before, are there kind of qualities maybe even outside of ability that you can kind of spot and be like, this is, this is the kid I think that's going to get it the quickest and maybe go even a little bit further. What are those qualities you think that kind of shine out? For sure. The one that comes to mind right away is like the willingness to learn. Mm-hmm. And I had to explain it to one of my kids who's a more senior kid this year, Mm -hmm. but like, it's not just yes, coach and move on. Like, don't get pissed at me. Yes, coach. I miss this read. Yes, coach. I miss this assignment. It's yeah, coach. But wait, I don't, I don't know what you mean. Like, Mm -hmm. can you explain that? Like, let's learn as opposed to just yes, coach, move on. 
Yeah. So the willingness to learn, I can tell, like, you can tell right away when a kid gets in the gym, if he's asking questions, why do I do this? Why are we setting this screen here? Why is this, why do I have to angle this way? Why are my feet set this way? You know what I mean? Like, there's so many things that you have to learn myself too. Like, if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer to it, I'm going to go home and be like, all right, why didn't I know the answer to that? So the willingness to learn is like massive for me as well as just like doing anything for the team. Like if I say, go out there and shoot the ball when you're open, go out there and shoot the ball when you're open. If it's to go out there and rebound head man, don't dribble the ball up the court, rebound, dribble the ball, like rebound, outlet and run. Like there are rules. So that's, that's the hardest one. I don't think anyone really catches that one too quick. You want that ball, you want to run. Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> get rid of it. It's like, dude, you yeah. get rid of it. That's, we turn the ball every time we dribble. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Um, so we got into a lot of the stuff that, that makes kids successful at the prep level, but what else happens in like the prep, I guess, ecosystem that really helps these kids go to D1 or, you know, really sought after in CIS programs? Yeah. You know what? Like the D1 thing I know is going to be a, it's, it's always yeah. a top of conversation. Mm-hmm. And the biggest thing about what I think prep is, Mm-hmm. I think prep is prepping you for your level. That's good. Does that make sense? Like yeah, the biggest thing for me is right. you are who you were recruited by. Mm-hmm. So if Sheridan college and Humber are recruiting you, that's your level. Right. Right now. So if mm-hmm. you're like a, a fifth year guy and you're getting recruited by Laurier, Waterloo, McMaster, Brock, any U sports team Mm -hmm. and then the colleges you're a U sports guy. Yeah. If you're getting calls from high major division ones, mid major division ones. Yeah. You're going to get a ton of calls from division two, high division two. Mm -hmm. You're a D one guy right now. So that is really tough for a lot of kids to kind of understand and if they're not being recruited, then that's my job. Like I have to make those calls. I have to sit there and grind hours mm-hmm. on hours on hours to get my guys looks. So that's a hundred percent on me. Their recruitment is on me, but it's understanding what level you are. That, yeah, that's a really, really important point that I actually, I've never thought about. And there's nothing wrong with being recruited to a U sports team, a CIS team. Like those are, those are, it's basketball is basketball. Uh, I'm hoping to get someone who actually went to the, who actually played for Ottawa and played pro, made a ton of money. Like there's still, there's still ways around it. You, you, you're, it, it's still a good situation. It's an amazing situation. And if we go back to Halton, if we think about Halton basketball as a whole, I know more guys right now, for, well, it's from my age group, but who are playing pro who didn't play D1. Right. Meshack Lafield played at Cape Breton. He's playing pro. Uh, Matt Marshall played pro. Um, Abendigo played pro. Dan Dooley played pro. And then you think about like Halton and all that. Like you don't have to go D1 and play pro. Mm -hmm. If your goal is to play D1, I love it. Like that should be your goal. Your goal should be if you're a basketball player, play the highest level basketball you can play. Mm -hmm. Best opportunity to go to the NBA, which every kid says they want to go to the NBA. The highest percent of kids who go to the NBA play Division One, so yeah, let's try to get there. It, it's tricky too because you could you could scratch and claw like if you're dying to play D one basketball, you can claw your way probably into like a last second offer somewhere where maybe not the highest level. You, you could you could do it, but don't you want to play basketball? Like, so and that's like, that's the biggest thing, for sure. That's the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Like you said, play at your level, right? And if you if you have to really press too too hard to get that D one, are you playing? Exactly. Like, and that's the hardest thing because he'll be fine if I talk about it. A kid mm-hmm. that I worked with starting last year, Mike Mattis. Mm-hmm. He's from Oakville, mm-hmm. six eight stretch four. Every mm-hmm. single team in the country wants a six eight stretch four who can do it, right? Mm-hmm. Mike wasn't getting any D one loves, and he was getting calls from junior colleges who's getting calls from the top d2 programs and i was having these calls before him and with mm-hmm. him and this he like these teams really want him like mm-hmm. the top d2s wanted him so bad mm-hmm. and then he got a sneaky d1 offer like it was a howard offer and it just wasn't mm-hmm. a fit for him 
So it came down to a couple schools that are D2 and then a, a last minute offer from the school he's at now, mm-hmm. which is a D1. Mm-hmm. And it was like, Mike, what do you want from this? Like, do you want to go to one of the best teams in the country at that level? Mm-hmm. Or do you want to go to a mid-major school that's division one? Mm-hmm. A bunch of humming and hawing. He did his thing. He did, talked to all of his different people who were involved in his recruitment. And he's like, coach, like, Dustin, my, my goal is to be a division one basketball player. So even if I come in as a 16th man, I'm going to bust my ass for four years and hopefully I can do something out there. So it just totally depends on the kid. Like myself, I might've been like, you know what? I'm going to go be the guy over here. Like I'm going to go do my thing yeah. try, to, try to get some all conference teams, try to break some record, whatever it is. Right. It's different personalities. Like there's some kids that can do it. Me person. I mean, I was never even close to that level, but I think my personality would have been a kind of like, I would, I would have liked to, to play, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever it is at whatever your sport is, but also considering D2 and Juco offers are legit. There's my school right now, uh, U Buffalo. Yeah. They were primarily a Juco team where they were just picking kids off left and right that were outperforming the Juco level. Yeah. So don't discount that as well. Like those, those are also good offers. And if it doesn't go D1 right out of high school, it doesn't mean it's not going to be D1 at some point. I don't even know how many guys last year from Canada went D1, like 50 or something, maybe 60 Mm -hmm. prepped out of how many prep teams, like how many teams are there in Mm -hmm. the DTA that are prep schools? Like tons and Mm -hmm. only plus all the regular high schools, plus the AAU programs, only 60 or something Canadians went D1 Mm -hmm. last year. So that is like, that's not the be all and end all. And if it is for you, then yeah, you'll be able to get to some Juco down there and bust your butt and perform against Grown ass men playing college ball. Yeah, exactly. you, you, better, you know what I mean? For sure. Uh, I had a question on Instagram about what league is more competitive, the OSBA or the NPA. I don't know what either of those are. So, can you explain what those are first <laughs> and then kind of go into your analysis? Yeah. So, the NPA is the league that we're a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, it's owned by the guys who started the who started Northville Hoops. Okay. Um, and then the OSBA is owned by part of Canada basketball or whatever. And they, I think, or like the guys who own Orangeville own the OSBA or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know too much about ownership or any style there. Um, but both have really competitive teams and really cool structured seasons. So they're just two different leagues doing similar things with similar teams. Mm -hmm. The OSBA for the longest time, I feel like this is myself. I don't want to upset anybody Mm -hmm. uh, has had more competitive basketball. Mm -hmm. Whenever Orangeville is in your league. Yeah. That's a good team. The best best team. Like they said, nine guys or something D1 last year. And I think the MPA had six or seven or eight or whatever total go. Right. And then TRC, when Tyrell Vernon, a guy who helps me out a little bit, um, was coaching there. They won back-to-back OSBA championships, and then they had how many guys go D1? Right. So the talent has been there. Um, the MPA, and a big reason I chose the MPA school over the OSBA school this year mm-hmm. um, was that I feel like, and I have a good enough relationship with Tarek, uh, mm-hmm. who runs it, that he'll help me get to where I want to go to, too. Hmm. or as well like he and those guys want their league to grow and they want it to grow properly right like they're not going to be doing any shady stuff to get anything happen like they won't Mm -hmm. be begging for teams to come over if you want to play with us you want to play with us right and they do such a good job of marketing their guys because they own the north pole hoop side of things as well and they know how to market players and they have the Mm -hmm. network that i just feel like it's a great setup like the way they do it is great. They're good people. And I think that genuinely they want to be doing the right things. Yeah. NPH has had a lot of success, especially with like the ranking systems that they do and getting sure. guys exposure. So it, it seems like OSBA may have an edge, but NPA, like if you get prep, that's, that's a good luck. It is. And you know what? The NPA is growing and trending in the right way. Like mm-hmm. we were the first team this year who was being able to bring over an ESPN ranked kit. Like that's a big deal for Canada basketball. Is like why is an American coming to play in Oakville? Mm-hmm. And then 
there's guys at Royal Crown who are NBA talent guys. And the Halton Prep has a kid who's an NBA potential kid. You were at one of his workouts, remember? Yep. All like, right. <laughs> that is what an NBA player looks like. They're like 6'9", yeah. and they're fast, strong, and can do everything. Right. And we're starting to get one of those. I think Abubakar Treyor, I probably butchered his name again, but he entered, <laughs> like, pre-draft, whatever. An mm-hmm. NBA-level kid. He's in the mm-hmm. NBA. There's guys everywhere. Atiki Atiki. He is being recruited by Power 5 schools, and he's in the NBA. Like, it's a good league. Elijah Fisher, too, right? You're bearing the lead. There you I go. I think he's at Crown, right? Uh, he's at Crestwood. Yeah. Crestwood, Crestwood. Yeah, so I think – I don't even know if Crestwood – Crestwood was in the OSBA last year. I, then they started up – Rose started up that league with Tony, the, C, the mm-hmm. Platinum, NSC Platinum. Like I like when there's competition because, you know, it ultimately makes everyone's product a little bit better. But at the sure. same time, you want to you want to see guys compete, right? So you might have like a really good matchup that's cross division that hopefully you can get set up. But like, yeah. exactly, and that's the tough thing. Is like this year, I wanted to play. I wanted to play Orangeville so bad <laughs> with the lineup that we created and the team right. that we built. Like I felt like there was no one that could beat us this year, mm-hmm. and I don't know how easy that game would have been. Like I don't know mm-hmm. how easy that would have been to get. Yeah. How fragile is the roster makeup? Obviously, there's a lot of turnover year over year because guys are graduating, going to different programs and uh, post-secondary. But, um, like, do you ever get a break from that recruitment process? Or, like, so those guys that are not coming over this year, is there any sort of guarantee you're going to get them next year? Like, or is it the whole process over again? It's, I guess, as how well you and your program do at maintaining relationships and building them. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Corey's got one more year and he's the point guard. So I'm just, we're going to be throwing all we got at him and try to bring mm-hmm. him up to the next year. Um, it's tough. Like it's tough because money is such an, a, a, like a talking point mm-hmm. in prep basketball. Right. So I have, and that's why I tell kids like, listen, it's going to be more expensive this year because you're a grade 10 or grade 11. Mm-hmm. You have to grind. Cause Teams want older kids who are better than you right now Mm -hmm. and they need them. Like that team needs a point guard. So they're going to bring that kid in for cheap or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I tell my guys when I recruit them, I'm going to say, I'm going to get you as good as you can, as good as you can be. So you have a bidding war next year. Like this team will say, we'll bring you over for 10 K. I'll bring you over 15. And then now it's like, no, no, no. We want this kid. Like now it's like negotiation. There's, almost like pro negotiations right? as a 16, 17 year old kid, which is unfortunately the way that it works nowadays. You know what I mean? Like that's the way it is. So cost is a huge consideration and there's a lot of worry for some of the high school guys that might not be able to afford a prep program. Um, there, There seem to be like genuine concern that like there might be a stigma if you don't go prep. Obviously, I don't want to put you in a false position because you are a prep coach. And No, I get it. But um, I guess the question here would be, in your opinion, do you think the talent shows out at the end of the day if you're dominating high school in a public level? You could- yeah. I think that that is the best way to do it. Like, mm-hmm. I was in a similar situation. I played summer ball with a team called Rita back in the day. It was at a St. Mary's uh, in Hamilton. And it was a prep school. Right. And my last year... Uh, coach Coney, Tony Upshaw was coaching the team again the year after and he gave me an offer to go play there and I couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't even close to what we charge, what teams charge now. Right. But it was, it wasn't an option. And I think that there's no way unless you're at one of the top high school programs, like my high school where I went to, we practiced five times a day and we had extra work and gym time whenever we wanted. We mm-hmm. weren't, we'd play against crappy schools once in a while and a lot of the time but at least you're developing mm-hmm. and then a lot of teams aren't like that a lot of high school teams don't take it that serious so i don't think there's any way to develop better than prep basketball like i legitimately believe that as a person right you're not going to develop if you don't play the highest level and you're not going to like you're going to develop but not the same rate mm-hmm. but if you go and score 30 a game or 40 a game and you're dominating mm-hmm. high school you're going to get looks right like 
I don't know what the setup was, but a good friend of mine and a teammate, Grant Mullins, he's from Burlington. Yep. He played a prep school. And then his last year, he went to a normal high school. Yeah. And then he's going like 50 every game mm-hmm. and he gets to go wherever he wanted. Like, I don't know if there's a pre setup that he already was committed before he transferred back or whatnot, mm-hmm. but he killed. And if you kill wherever you are, you can go. And there's also a great option of if you can't afford the prep school thing, grind your butt off mm-hmm. and play AAU basketball. Right. And then you go play in front of coaches and perform. It, it just, it's frustrating at this level because you hear it all the time. Like prep right. this, prep that, basketball this, basketball that. If you can't do it at that level, you're not going that level. Right. And that's just like the cold, hard truth of basketball. There is just infrastructure that high school can't compete with when you go to the prep side. Like we talked about like the house and the, the <laughs> training and, and basketball is it's 24 seven and you're getting a great education and it, it's what your money pays for. But I mean, it doesn't mean you can't make the best out of your circumstance. Right. I mean, um, I, actually, I wanted to talk about this anyways, a guy you trained Brady Heslop played a couple years in Nelson, uh, my high school and you know, there, there's path, there are pathways. I, and I actually wanted to talk to you about Brady specifically, because I know that's a guy that you got into train and know pretty well. Yeah. Um, first of all, there's a YouTube video on your YouTube, Dustin McTaggart, <laughs> of um, Brady one Heslip. Video. There's only one video on that channel, so don't worry about going to follow that. There's one video. It's a good video, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's a video of Brady Heslip hitting 100 out of 106 threes. Um, can you just talk about, like, what happened? How did that come about? Dude, like, this is going to sound messed up. <laughs> yeah. But the guy doesn't miss. Mm-hmm. Like, it, so the story behind that video mm-hmm. is, and first off, Brady played high school basketball for four years, mm-hmm. committed to Guelph, and then yeah. went in and busted ass in AAU. Yeah. And, Matt, he went to Boston College in Baylor and a six man, six man of the decade at Baylor. But <laughs> first off, was it nine threes or 12 threes at Baylor? I remember there's one crazy game he had and I watched it. Was it nine? It was a I don't know what the number was, but I know exactly. Like what crazy. Yeah. Dude, he's he's like, in that G League. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 45 points a couple times. I think they just had a feature on him recently. And yeah. Brady. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. No, he's first off, he helped me out like crazy. I mm-hmm. wouldn't, I don't think I'd be where I am right now if he didn't help me out. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, so that was at the end of a full workout. So we didn't get in there fresh. We, I busted his ass for an hour. And then I do a thing with shooters. And sometimes, like most of the time, if there's, like, if there's an open gym, like the one that we were at that day, I always do 100 makes to end. Right? And if you watch that video closely, yeah, those weren't just catch and shoots. Like, I would throw it at his right hand and he had to catch it with his right hand. I'll throw it at his left hand. He could only catch it with his left hand. It was mm-hmm. deep. It was at the end of a workout. And right. he, if you watch it closely, he misses two early. Right. I think he hit like 60 something in a row and then like, <laughs> like 80 with two misses. Right. And at the time, like I just saw the Steph video of him hitting like 106 in a row or whatever. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I was looking for Steph's numbers, and Steph's numbers were worse than Brady's at the time. You're right. So that isn't like that isn't crazy to me for him. Mm-hmm. That guy doesn't miss. He is the best individual workouts I've ever seen, and I've heard that from other guys who've worked him out, who've worked with consistent NBA level guys. His workouts are messed up. There was uh, so Brady had a stint with. Mostly Raptors 905. He had, I thought, a really good chance of making the team legitimately one year. And there was like a tweet that that kind of went out talking about how someone was watching Brady shoot uh, pregame and did not miss for like 10 or 15 minutes or something crazy like that. Just catch you, catch you, just on his own. <laughs> it is like the way to, he's one of the best shooters in the world ever. Mm hmm. And people don't understand that, but I think Penny Hardaway actually said it when they're talking about guys in the NBA draft this year. There's one kid, I forget who it was, could shoot it. And he was like, Buddy Hield, Steph, Clay, Brady has to, and he just like kind of <laughs> it off. He was just like, wait, what? But um, he, like, I don't know how to explain it, 
it does, the ball doesn't hit the rim. Right. <laughs> like it's like, phenomenal. I mean, we, we've seen it. If you go Dustin McTaggart's YouTube, you'll, <laughs> you'll see it. Um, uh, besides, obviously, the just the gift he has of shooting the ball. Is there anything that you caught from those workouts that you try to kind of project on the kids you work with now? For sure. He doesn't take any reps off. And like everyone always says, like, don't take a rep off. Like that's like a cliche thing. Like mm -hmm. even the workouts that I was doing with him was like right after he announced his retirement. Right. So this guy's done playing ball. He's going to school. Yeah. And it he's hurts. sprinting change of pace, sprinting off ball screens, catch and shoot with dribble pull-ups or full speed fadeaways, like, and not missing and not losing concentration or not working hard. Like, right. a, like he worked hard the whole, every single workout, whether it's through ball handling, finishing series floaters or threes. Like, mm -hmm. he just didn't stop working, which is hard to do. It's super frustrating too, because you've seen this you know this happens, this is possible, but then it almost seems unrealistic when you're telling players that you work with now to do the same thing. It, it's 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 a, just a different mindset, different level of work that it's hard to tap into. It's, I think that's the hardest thing, especially yeah. when you go twice a day, every single day, or it's mm -hmm. every day in the summer when it's 40 degrees outside and it's locked down, you're outside. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, if you asked everyone in Canada except for one kid, if you left Elijah Fisher out of <laughs> the right. conversation, he's, and still, he might never be ranked number one anymore. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. are you ranked number one in your class right now? No. Are you the best player on your prep school? Maybe, probably not. Are you the best player at your high school? And it goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So say you're not the number one kid in your class, but you're the best player in your, your prep school. Mm -hmm. that kid who's number one or number two or number three in that class are working their ass off to be an NBA player right? or a division one high major kid. Mm -hmm. You have to work that much harder than that kid to get to where he is right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're not into it, like into it, into it, into it, like sleep, breathe, eat, drink basketball and work like that's not for you. Like it might be, but it's not that level of it. You're yeah. not an NBA player. You don't want to be an NBA player. That's always something I found frustrating as well. When you're, I, I think some players fall through, like slip through those cracks, right? Because there's players in the NBA that have a reputation of being lazy. I remember listening to, I forget the podcast, or maybe it was just a broadcast, but um, there's players in the NBA whose favorite sports aren't basketball. I think that was the rumor with Anthony Edwards this year, but like there's hey. guys that just, they don't know how to play and, they, they kind of slip through the cracks. So that's not going to be you. <laughs> it's going <laughs> to like, I know there's guys that do it, but that's not going to be you. You're going to have to to work hard, but yeah, it's, 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 it's something else. It is. And you like, you can see it and it's so frustrating. And I'm not going to name any names, but I got a play. <laughs> I think could be a really good division one point guard. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, why do I have to get at you all the time to just work hard? Yeah. Like, I, I want to I workshop that. Like, what do you, like, if you put yourself in that position and like you're that close, do you think there could be kids that are just like scared of being that good? Do you think there's kids that don't, don't maybe want that responsibility? I, I never understood it. You know what? There's, there's so many different things and mental health and just where mm -hmm. people are at is not always easy to read or easy to see. Mm -hmm. But I think that, yeah, some kids might be scared of it. Some kids, might not want it. Some kids might want to just chill out and, but their parents want them to be basketball players. Right. Right. Like, or there's so many different things and each kid is so individual and people are so like weird as <laughs> humans. Like <laughs> he might just not want it or she might not just want it. Like it just could be, that's not their thing. Yeah. I think that's one of those things that will probably bother me forever that there's going to be, unfortunately kids that are talented enough they just don't want it and part of me wants to be like it's okay to not want it. like it's like you want to be an engineer or whatever like do what you want to do but it's like sure yeah it's i it's always have this that's a good point i always have this talks with my kids pretty or 
pretty early on in the, mm-hmm. in the year because everyone always says like this adulting sucks like it sucks being yeah. <laughs> you don't know shit until you are 23 24 you're not if you're getting shit. catered three times a day for your food and you live on a wing of a house you, you're not adulting <laughs> You know, yeah, you're right. That's the thing. Is like I have the best job in the world. I love yeah. what I do. And before I did this, I hated what I did. Mm. I was in the business side of IT, driving yeah. on the four four hundred one every single day, sitting in traffic, miserable. Mm-hmm. That is what what ninety percent of people do is hate their job. Like they wake yeah. up and like I don't want to fucking go to work today. Right. When I have that talk with the kids like listen like you have like if you're in grade 12 you have 12 months left of basketball if you don't play again. like mm-hmm. real basketball if you don't play right. college you're 12 months mm-hmm. and after that 12 months you go to school and after your school you'll go to a job that you probably don't love right and you'll have to do that for 35 years and then you'll be old enough to retire and do nothing <laughs> dude I, i'm just thinking right now at your level where you have to pay pretty significant money to, 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 to be a part of that and then to not want it. Like, and that's the thing. Like, I think a lot of these kids want it, Mm -hmm. but I don't think a hundred, like, I don't know what the percentage is, but Mm -hmm. I don't think they know what it means to want it. Right. And I can only imagine it's gonna get more and more because like we said at the very, very top, like the kids are getting more, more and more talented but just because you're really good at something doesn't mean you love it. So when you have that 10 year old, that's amazing ball handling grows up to be 16, you know, maybe likes journalism better or whatever, whatever it is, or like just doesn't want to work that hard for some for like basketball. Yeah. Basketball. That's exactly. It. And there's probably there's kids in every sport and in everything. There's probably kids who could be the best author of all time. And they just don't want, to, you know what I mean? Like they're just, nah, right. nah. <laughs> I'll play Fortnite with my friends and that can still make you a lot of money somehow but yeah, sure. that's about it's, 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 it's on the table now <laughs> yeah i might have to do it i saw what those got like stupid money yeah i think it was a ninja or something makes was it seven million i think it's even more than seven million a year now which is ridiculous it's more than so some lot. more than a lot of basketball players uh dustin i think that's everything i had unless there's other stuff you wanted to touch on that i might have forgot no, man, I think that's good. I think that it's important to have this talk, especially with kids who are like thinking prep. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the prep school tuitions are the price of a new car. Yeah, it's not cheap. <laughs> it's, not cheap. it's not cheap at all. So if you really want it, that could be the best investment in your life. Mm-hmm. And it could also be whatever. Like, it just depends on what you want to do with it. If you want to play prep to get the hat and get the gear in the tracksuit, then go buy a tech fleece tracksuit and put someone on it. It's an expensive tracksuit. <laughs> it's a really expensive tracksuit. Okay. Well, I think that's all I got. Dustin, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Um, everyone be on the lookout for Oakville Prep. It sounds like you guys would have had a really, really good year this year if it was not for some, some things that happened in the world. Yes. Little, little hiccups here and there yeah a little a little speed bump <laughs> all right thank you dustin yeah i appreciate it man thanks for having me on